Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you to the California Privacy Protection Agency Board's June 8, 2022 meeting. My name is Jennifer Urban, and I am the chairperson of the board for the agency. Before we get started with the substance of the meeting, I have some logistical announcements. First, I'd like to ask everyone um, to please check that your microphone is muted, although I'll we'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Second, I'd like to ask everyone who is here in person to silence their cell phones. Thank you. Third, this meeting is being recorded. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. I'm pleased to be here in person with the board and with some members of the public. Welcome to all of you. And I'd like to welcome everyone um, who is joining us via Zoom as well. As with our May 26, 2022 meeting, I do have some observations and requests related to the hybrid meeting format and our request to wear masks. First, the rapid increase in COVID-19 cases in California generally, and specifically in Alameda County where our physical meeting is located, has continued. And it has created some substantial logistical challenges on which I hope you will bear with us. We have encouraged the public to join the meeting remotely. We are also strongly encouraging everyone to wear masks if you are attending in person. The CPPA is not requiring either of these things, just encouraging them. However, since our last meeting, Alameda County has reinstated its requirement that masks must be worn in many buildings, including government buildings like this one. We appreciate everyone here in person following this requirement. I also thought it would be helpful to say just a little bit about why we are encouraging this approach, even though we are excited to be here in person together and generally to be moving to in-person meetings. First, the current variant of COVID-19 is still spreading extremely rapidly due to a high level of contagiousness. And of course, we want to avoid exposing vulnerable members of the community or inadvertently making our public meetings less accessible to those members of our community. Second, and this is something that is less like intuitive, I think, to many people, our temporary ability to meet remotely and still comply with Bagley Keene has expired and has thus far not been renewed. This means, unfortunately, that the rapid spread of the virus could pose some serious logistical issues to the board's work on behalf of the public. This is because we no longer have the option under Bagley Keene of holding entirely remote meetings or for any board member to participate remotely even if they test positive. This means that a COVID-19 positive board member simply cannot participate in a public meeting. In addition, our board meetings must be publicly noticed 10 days in advance with all physical and remote locations correct on the notice. Accordingly, we cannot easily reschedule if board members test positive or become ill. This brings me to my second request, which is that everyone please bear with us as regards to any kinks as we run the meeting. We have found that the hybrid in-person and remote meeting can be somewhat complex to administer and ask for patience. If the remote meeting glitches, for example, if the audio cuts out, we will pause to fix it. I'll say more about this in a minute as I explain the meeting logistics. But I really appreciate everyone bearing with us. Thank you. Okay, now I'll go over logistics and meeting participation. We will proceed through the agenda, which is available as a handout here in Oakland and also on the CPPA website. Materials for the meeting are also available as handouts here and on the CPPA website. You may notice board members accessing their laptops or other devices during the meeting. They are using these devices solely to access board meeting materials. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by the board members. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment, agenda item number five today, and I will also ask for public comment as we go through the agenda items. We have members of the public attending online via Zoom and also in person here in Oakland. If you are attending via Zoom and you wish to speak on an item, please wait until I call for public comment on that item and allow for staff to prepare for Zoom public comment. I'll say more about that when we get to our first call for public comment so it's clear to everyone. 
But for now, you will use your raise your hand function in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, so you may wish to locate that now. Our moderator will request that you unmute yourself for comment. Please note that you must wait for the moderator to give you the ability to unmute. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you again. For those of you on Zoom, please also note that the board will not be able to see you, only hear your voice. Thus, it is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is entirely voluntary, and you can also input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting. If you are attending in person and wish to speak on an item, please wait for me to call for public comment, then move toward the podium and form a line, keeping social distancing in place. Please move to the podium directly when you are called to speak in your turn. As with the Zoom attendees, it is helpful if you identify yourself when you begin speaking, but again, this is entirely voluntary, and you are free to refer to yourself with a pseudonym or not give a name. Please speak into the microphone so that everyone participating remotely can hear you and so your remarks can be recorded in the meeting record. I would also like to remind everyone of the rules of the road under Bagley Keene. Both board members and members of the public may only discuss items that are on the agenda for today when those items are up for the discussion. The public can also bring up additional topics when the board takes up the agenda item for that purpose, which is the agenda item I mentioned, number five today. In addition, items not on the agenda can be suggested for discussion at future meetings when the board takes up the agenda item designated for that purpose, and that is number six today. The board welcomes public comment on any item of the, the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board voting on any item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak, please let us know. If you are participating via Zoom, use the raise your hand function so our moderator can recognize you. And if you are in person, please raise your hand and wave at me to let me know I forgot. You will then be called to the podium to provide your comment. Okay, as I mentioned, um, these hybrid meeting formats are, the hybrid meeting format, excuse me, is somewhat complex. So first, I'd like to thank the team managing the technical aspects of the meeting today. Um, very grateful to Ms. Trini Hurtado, Ms. Megan Sullivan, and Mr. Oscar Estrella. Second, I will explain what to do if those of you attending remotely experience an issue with the remote meeting. For example, the audio dropping. If something happens, please email info at cppa.ca.gov, that's I, N for Nancy, F for Frank, O at cppa.californiaca.gov. This will be monitored throughout the meeting. If there is an issue that affects the remote meeting, we will pause the meeting to let our technical staff work on fixing the issue. And again, I thank everybody for patience if we need it. We will take a lunch break um, when appropriate and shorter breaks as needed. I will announce each break and when we plan to return, so that members of the public can leave and come back if they wish before we begin again. My thanks to all the board members for their service and to all the people working to make this meeting possible. I would like to thank the team from the Office of the Attorney General supporting us today. Mr. Malad Dalju is asking, acting as our meeting counsel, Ms. Trini Hurtado, whom I mentioned, and her team of conference services experts have organized the meeting infrastructure and are moderating today. I would also like to thank the team of expert attorneys from the Office of the Attorney General who are supporting the agency in its substantive work. I will say a little bit more about that later in the meeting. From the CPPA, I would like to thank Ashkan Sultani, our Executive Director, Brian Souble, our Acting General Counsel, Bon Chidambira, our Deputy Director of Administration, and all the CPPA staff for their work behind the scenes. I'd also like to continue to express my gratitude to the team of the Department of Consumer Affairs for managing our communications list and website, and the staff at the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, the Department of Consumer Affairs, Department of General Services, the Office of the Attorney General, and other agencies who also continue to help behind the scenes as we grow our agency. I will now call the meeting to order and ask our moderator, Ms. Hurtado, to please conduct the roll call. Good morning. Uh, I'll begin the roll call. Uh, Ms. Delatore? Mr. Lay? 
Present. Ms. Sierra? Present. Mr. Thompson? Present. Ms. Urban? Present. There are four members present and one not present. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. The board has established a quorum. I would like to say that Ms. De La Torre regrets that she cannot be with us today. Um, and we will go ahead and continue. I would also um, like to let board members know that we will be taking a roll call vote on any action items. All right, the next on the agenda is um, uh, agenda item number two. This will cover a brief clarification on one of the changes the board made to the incompatible activities statement for board members during our May 26, 2022 meeting. I'm actually gonna take this um, item out of order. We'll skip it now and return to it after the next two agenda items. So with that, we will move to agenda items number three and four, which we will discuss together. Agenda item number three is titled Discussion and Possible Action Regarding Proposed Regulations, Sections 7000 to 7304, to implement, interpret, and make specific the California Privacy Act of 2018, as amended by the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, including possible notice of proposed action. Agenda item four is titled Delegation of Authority to the Executive Director for Rulemaking Functions. We're going to discuss them together because there is only one potential action here. That is, the board will be hearing from staff on and will be discussing whether to approve starting the formal rulemaking process for this proposed rulemaking package, which includes authorizing the executive director to take the steps necessary to do this. Because we're a new agency and a new board, it was my mistake, I mistakenly split this when I drafted the agenda, so we will take them together. I will say first a bit about the process related to these items and a bit about the purpose of the discussion. And then a description of the draft proposed regulatory text will be presented by council. So to briefly recap the process so far, and again, for everyone who's been following along through our work, um, thank you for your patience as I uh, work to bring up to speed anyone who's just joining us. The board has been working since last fall in subcommittees with council um, from the agency and the office of the attorney general uh, to work on draft regulations um, under, uh, as we are uh, request, asked to do under the CPRA as it amends the CCPA. Uh, we have requested preliminary written comments, which we received last fall. We held informational sessions with experts from academia and other agencies. We held stakeholder sessions uh, where we heard from stakeholders. Um, and all of that information was gathered up and went into the dra uh, draft, a package of draft proposed regulations, um, which is um, part of the meeting materials for these agenda items today. Now, I'm gonna say a little bit about where we are and how the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act in, uh, interacts with rulemaking, because this is a source of some confusion, I think, and it's completely understandable confusion. Um, indeed, staff have prepared an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions document that you can find on our website on the regulations page um, to help explain this, um, because it's just not intuitive to a lot of people. Um, so for those of you who are familiar, again, thanks for your patience. I've explained this at a few public events, but of course not everyone's gonna be familiar with how boards and commissions operate um, under the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act and how that interacts with the California Administrative Procedure Act. So I'll just walk through it briefly. I'll actually start with the California APA. When an agency in California writes regulations to implement a statute, it must follow the APA which requires a formal process to ensure that the public has input. If you look at the materials for agenda item 5A from our May 26th, 2022 board meeting, you'll find a slide presentation from the rulemaking process subcommittee. On slide two, there's a graphic that describes the APA process at a high level. In short, once a rulemaking package is ready, it is published with a notice of proposed action and some explanatory materials, including an initial statement of reasons, which explains the background on the agency's reasoning. That package is subject to a period of at least five, 45 days, during which the public can submit written comments to the agency on the proposed rulemaking package. 
And indeed, they can, you know, they can send email, you can submit comments in sort of any way during that 45 day at least period. There's also usually a hearing, and if I'm recalling our May 26th conversation correctly, we're definitely planning to have a hearing. Mr. Thompson is nodding, and um, that was the consensus. So there'll be a hearing as well. The agency will consider all of these formal comments. If it makes substantial changes in response, then there will be another time period for written comments of at least 15 days. The agency will summarize and respond to all those comments in the final statement of reasons that is submitted with the final rulemaking package to the Office of Administrative Law. It's a very high level overview, but it's just so everyone has a picture of how um, rulemaking happens should we approve the package to go forward for rulemaking and that there are robust procedures um, for public comment, which we are very much looking forward to. We are not there yet, and this is the part that I think is, can be puzzling. The agency has not yet commenced the formal rulemaking process, so why are we here today? That's where the bagley keene Open Meeting Act comes in. The California Privacy Protection Agency is governed by this board. Under our implementing statute, the board holds the agency's rulemaking authority, which means that it is our job to approve commencing the formal rulemaking process. The board is governed by the bagley keene Open Meeting Act, which means that all of our discussions um, are considered in public meetings that are noticed at least 10 calendar days in advance, and any materials that we use for the meeting that are distributed to us are also available to the public. So in practice, what that means is that the public gets to see our draft regulations and listen to and comment on our discussion about the process before we ever start the formal rulemaking. This is different from what many regulatory advocates are familiar with, especially for federal rulemaking, but also for other state agencies who are not, that are not governed by boards, because in most situations, the draft rules are published with the notice to start the formal rulemaking process. So we are, one, we are a step ahead of that um, and um, have put the rules out in advance of that. So what are we considering today? Today, we will be considering a motion to start the formal rulemaking process and authorize the steps and needed to accomplish that. Um, should that motion carry, then the formal rulemaking process will commence. Um, but it is not a decision by the board um, on whether to adopt the final rules or whether to amend them. The board will need to have further meetings to discuss public comment and make further decisions about the rules. So um, accordingly, the motion before us will be um, whether to approve the draft proposed regulatory text for the formal rulemaking process and authorize the executive director to take the steps necessary to initiate that. To support, support our discussion, we have in front of, of us the draft proposed regulatory text, which council will introduce in a moment. We also have a draft initial statement of reasons. This is supportive material that will be on the regulatory package, and I'm really grateful to staff and council for getting it ready for us so we have this background information too. I also want to thank staff and council for the careful, thorough work they have done on this pro draft proposed regulatory text. In my view, this is very impressive work on a very difficult timeline that takes into account a lot of really helpful feedback from the public. I would also like to thank them specifically for getting both the board and the public the draft text so quickly after the May 26th board meeting in which we discussed process. Indeed, the very next day, this gave us all the maximum time to review before today's meeting. And I would also like to thank them for getting a draft eyesore ready for us to serve as background. These materials support our discussion, of course, but also provide that extra measure of transparency and notice for the public that Bagley Keen requires well before the formal process commences. And I just want to say I know it was a lot of work, and I really value that work. I will now turn things over to attorneys from the team at the Office of the Attorney General that has been assisting the agency in putting together the draft regulations, acting as counsel for the agency. This team and members of the team from the agency itself <coughs> have been tireless in considering all the preliminary information we've gathered and working with the board subcommittees and agency staff to carefully draft regulatory text. They're peerless in their expertise they have experience with consumer law generally, privacy law, and specifically the California Consumer Privacy Act and the existing CCPA regulations and California administrative law. I would like to especially thank the two members of the team who are presenting to us today. 
Deputy Attorney General Lisa Kim, and Senior Deputy Attorney General Stacey Schesser. I will now turn it over to them for an overview of the draft proposed regulatory text, after which we will turn to board questions and discussion, followed by public comment. Deputy Attorney General Kim, thank you very much for all your work on this and for presenting to us today. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Chairperson Urban. Good morning. My name is Lisa Kim, as um, Chairperson Urban stated, uh, and I've been assisting the agency in preparing and drafting the regulations and with regard to this general rulemaking process. Um, Supervising Deputy Attorney General Stacey Schesser and I will be providing a general overview on a high level of the proposed regulations, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you may have about the particular sections or anything, um, or if you'd like me to speak in greater depth with regard to any of the particular sections throughout. But as an initial matter, I just also wanted to point out to you, um, just as Chairperson Urban, Urban mentioned, the eyesore or we call it the ISOR for short, but it's the initial statement of reasons, is a very helpful and useful document. It basically answers the question of why is the regulation necessary and what benefits does it provide? And so if there's any particular thing that you wanted to go back to at a later time, it's a great place to start. Also, I th thought I'd point out in case it wasn't uh, obvious, but the PDFs that are on our meeting materials on the website are actually bookmarked. So if you open up the bookmark tab, it's a very useful tool that I use particularly often, and it's easy to navigate through the document for both the regulations and the ISOR. Um, I wanted to note also that since providing the actual draft regulations to the board, we have caught a few non-substantive errors just with regard to formatting and that sort of thing. And so we intend to correct those prior to uh, commencing any kind of formal rulemaking. Um, so I want to give that heads up to you all. So speaking about the general overview of the proposed regulations, the proposed regulations generally do three things. The first thing it does is update existing CCPA regulations to harmonize them with the CPRA amendments to the CCPA and to address any confusion that exists in the marketplace even now. The second thing it does is it operationalizes new rights and new concepts that were introduced by the CPRA amendments. And thirdly, it reorganizes and consolidates some of the requirements in the law so that, so that it is easier to follow and understand. It basically restates the law, consolidates them into one place just so that it aids in the understanding. I'll work through the there are nine articles currently, and the first, art, uh, first eight articles are basically the same, but they've been added to. Article nine covers investigations and enforcement, and Ms. Schesser will be covering that as when I'm done with the first eight. But I just want to walk you through the different articles and point out the three components that I had just mentioned. So starting with article one, that is the section that deals with general provisions of the CCPA regulations. It covers definitions that are used throughout the regulations themselves. And again, here is an example of how we're updating the existing CCPA regulations. Um, one example would be the use of the term consent. That is a new term that was introduced by the CPRA amendments, and it replaces affirmative authorization, which is what we had previously used for that term. Um, and so affirmative authorization is deleted, and so there's an example of how we're updating to align the regulations to the existing law. Second is with regard to implementing new concepts. We include in this section a section um, 7004, which has to do with giving consumer consent, and it addresses this idea of that was introduced by the CPRA amendments that has to do with the fact that consent that is obtained through the use of dark patterns is not considered consent. And so what the question is left for um, the office or for the agency is to explain what is a dark pattern. And so section 7004 sets forth that in greater detail and provides many examples for the public to understand that. Um, an example of how we restate and reorganize the law to aid in the understanding would be uh, section 7002, 
which is also in that general provisions. This pertains to data minimization and purpose limitations that were newly introduced in Civil Code Section 1798-100. Now, this is something that is in the law, but we brought them into the RECs to help businesses understand what is required of them when it comes to only collecting information that's necessary and proportionate to the purpose that it serves. And then also, again, another example of us restating the law and reorganizing it so that it's easier for um, the public to understand is Section 7003, which sets forth all the requirements for disclosures. It puts all the, um, all the information about how disclosures to consumers, um, it puts that all in one place instead of repeating it over and over again in the separate sections that deal with the particular notices to be given to consumers. And so he, we thought that that would make a lot more sense for consumers to be able to understand. Moving on to Article 2. Article 2 has to do with the different required disclosures that the CCPA um, expects businesses to give to consumers. Again, here we are updating existing CCPA regs to align them to the new language of the law. There's, um, a, there's updating that has been done in the notice at collection requirements that pertains to third parties that are controlling the collection of personal information on the first party's online or offline premises. We've also updated the notice of the right to opt out of sale because the CPRA and then the CCPA to extend that right to both sale and sharing of personal information. Some of the new concepts that are introduced in this section have to do with the limit the use of my sensitive personal information link. That is something that was newly introduced, a new right that was introduced by the CPRA amendments, and so that has been operationalized in Article 2. And also, with regard to the reorganization and the restatement of the law, we have section on, uh, a good example of that, of that is the section on privacy policies. It looks like there's a lot of red in that section, but in actuality, it's not changed very much substantively. It's just been reorganized to sort of uh, to map out or to follow the organization in which most businesses put their privacy policies together currently so that it's easier for um, the public and businesses in particular to understand what is required to be in the privacy statement. Um, moving on to Article 3. Article 3 um, is the business practices for handling consumer requests. This was previously the section that uh, set forth all the methods and the timelines and specifications with regard to CCPA requests that are made to businesses under, under the CCPA. Um, again, here we have updated existing regulations. Um, we have extended the right to opt out of sale to include the right to opt out of sale and sharing of personal information. We have, have updated the methods by which um, consumers can uh, submit their CCPA requests to align to the existing law, um, the changes that were made to the law. Um, we've corrected that, or we have clarified that the right to know and the right to delete no longer applies to household information because that has, is a change that was made by the CPRA amendments to the CCPA. We have also in Article 3 put to uh, operationalize the new rights introduced by the CPRA, specifically the right to correct, as well as the right to limit the use of my sensitive personal information. There we have noted which methods should be used or offered by the business with regard to submitting those requests, as well as which timelines by which uh, a business must respond to those requests. Um, a few other things, I, I, there's a lot in there and I'm kind of covering it at a high level. But another example of something that we've done there to um, operationalize things is the um, opt-out preference signal. Um, the opt-out preference signal in, seven, in Civil Code Section 1798, 185, subsection A19 and A20 are, is authority that was given to the agency to set forth the requirements for our opt-out preference signal. This is a section, this section has often been misunderstood with regard to um, interpretations that the opt-out preference signal is optional to respond to by businesses, but this is not what the law itself says. And so this section here, which I believe is 
1725, 7025, section 7025, um, sets forth how you know, the, the law works. And so the regulations, as well as the ISOR, address this head on and clearly explain how the statute works. Finally, with regard to the reorganization that was made in Article 3, um, there were some things that we did in that section to kind of aid in the public's understanding of the regulations. And one that I can point out to is with regard to um, the right to limit the use of sensitive personal information. There are many exceptions to that right, and the exceptions are somewhat spread out throughout all of the CCPA. Um, and so what we did was we tried to consolidate those and set them forth very clearly so businesses understand what are the exceptions that apply to the request to limit. Article four is the section that deals with service providers, contractors, and third parties. Again, we update the existing CCP re CCPA regulations in there. Um, there were amendments that were made to the CCPA by the CPRA that speak to the purposes for which service providers can process personal information. So that's been um, updated to align to the language of the statute. There's new concepts that were added there because there is a new uh, group of persons that have been introduced into uh, the CCPA by Prop 24, the CPRA, and that is the term contractors. So we clarified um, what requirements apply to contractors and updated that as well. And finally, we reorganized uh, or provided some reorganization and restated all the contractual requirements um, that the CPRA amendments add to the CCPA. Um, and that pertains to certain contract requirements of what must be in a contract, in, uh, must be in a contract with a service provider or a contractor. Some of this is all spread out again throughout the statute. And what we did is we pulled them all from the different subsections to put them in one place so it was very clear that businesses understand what is required of a contract with a service provider or contractor. Similarly, there is a new requirement in the, in the CCPA by the CPRA and a amendments that pertain to contractual a contract to be in place with regard to third parties. And this is a new um, section within the CCPA, and so that has been clearly set forth and included in this section. Um, finally, for my portion, Articles 5 through 8, these are pretty much the same as, as before. This has to do with verification and special rules for consumers under the age of 16, non-discrimination, and training and record keeping. There has been updating throughout those um, articles that align the language of the regulations um, with the CPRA amendments to the CCPA. But on the most part, they're very, um, they, they pretty much track similarly to what they said before. Now I'm gonna turn over to my colleague, Ms. Schesser, and she will cover Article 9. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Article 9, I, again, I'm gonna go through a high-level overview as Ms. Kim just did so eloquently for the first articles from Article 1 through Article 8. Article 9 covers investigations and enforcement. Um, these provisions outline first what is required to be in a public complaint to the agency, which leads to an investigation and is governed by Civil Code Section 1798.199.45. For example, the proposed regulation provides how sworn complaints may be submitted to the agency, and it also balances maintaining the confidentiality of what's alleged in those complaints to balance the agency's interest in conducting its investigation. The article then goes on to outline how the agency may open its own investigations and permits the agency to open a matter at its own determination. The next provision establishes requirements for probable cause hearings. This is a threshold procedural requirement before the administrative enforcement process may begin. The context to this, is, this section is particularly important as the CIPRA amendments to the CCPA codified in Civil, section, Civil Code Section 1788 0.199.555 and is a requirement for the agency's administrative enforcement process. Importantly, any probable cause determination is not a final decision on the merits of the entire investigation. It is a preliminary hurdle that must be cleared in order to proceed with an enforcement action. 
The process for conducting an administrative hearing, which follows a probable cause finding, is codified in the APA, starting at Government Code <clears throat> Section 11500. The process is highly detailed, and there is no need for further regulations in this area. <clears throat> Article 9 also establishes regulations for how the agency resolves an investigation through the filing of a stipulated order entered by the board. For example, if the parties were to reach a negotiated resolution without an administrative hearing. Finally, the last section outlines the agency's audit authority and is pursuant to 1798.185A18. Audit is an investigatory tool and similar to an administrative <coughs> subpoena. It covers who the agency may audit, how a subject is selected for audit, and how any personal information shall be protected under an existing legal framework for a state agency. Thank you. Sorry, the mask is, uh, is stymied me. Um, thank you both very much for um, that helpful presentation. Are there questions or comments? And it's all right if we ask you questions. Yes, you're ready for questions. Okay, great. Are there comments or questions from board members? I, I can go ahead. Mr. Lay, please. Yeah, I just uh, you know want to thank you all for your work. These are very detailed. Um, you know, it's going to be a while for us, for me at least, to, to process all of these. But you know, I think you did a really good job of you know providing examples for businesses and California consumers, and um, you know making sure that these rules, especially the the stuff around dark patterns, uh, make sure that we we get actual consent and then consumers actually know what they're getting into and uh, have the least barriers to just browsing the internet um, and protecting their privacy at the same time. So yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Sierra? Yes, thank you, Chair Urban. And I too um, very much want to thank Deputy. Ms. Sierra, can you speak closer to the microphone? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So I too would very much um, like to thank Deputy Attorney General Lisa Kim, um, supervising Deputy Attorney General Jason Chester for all this work. This is, I'm very, very impressed as well. And um, I'm, I'm finding, um, working through and reading um, the initial statement of reasons, the ISOR, extremely helpful. And I think it's gonna be very helpful to the public as well as all of us as board members and to businesses to really understand the thinking and the rationale and what was considered. So, um, you know, kudos to you both for all this work on this. Um, you know, just for example, I'm looking at when you were speaking about the data minimization, you know, I think the explanation in the ISOR is extremely helpful on that, on that point. And I also very much appreciate toward the um, latter part of the initial statement of reasons, the um, different concepts that were considered and the balancing and the thought that went behind some of those decisions on those key concepts. So I think that's um, very, very helpful. So I think, you know, as we are going through this and, you know, listening to the public comment that we receive on these, you know, I will be guided by these and we'll, I'm very open into hearing all the different perspectives on these issues. But right now, seeing this proposed draft, I feel like it does provide a lot of clarity I think the clarity was gonna help both businesses and consumers. I think the, um, the different examples are very helpful and um, I'll be very interested in hearing the different thoughts on them. So thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Other comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Thompson, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah, I wanna echo the, the comments that have been made and, and thank the staff and, and the rest of the board for this incredible milestone that, that we've reached in this process. Um, this has been an interesting journey uh, since we started as an agency a little over a year ago, and this is a really significant and, and major milestone. Thank you for the fine work that has gone into this product. You know, I think we all share a desire to ensure that we issue regulations and, and enforce those regulations in a way that protects consumers' privacy in a way and allow consumers to understand and make informed decisions about protecting their own privacy and balancing that with, with clarity and regulatory certainty for those who are regulated under, their, under these regulations. Um, I'm, like uh, Mr. Lay said, I'm still digesting 
uh, the, the regulations and the initial statement of reasons. And what I've seen thus far, I think we're doing a good job in, in striking that balance and, and taking a mix of approaches um, from mandates on, on the regulated entities, definition of affirmative rights that, that consumers possess, and then harnessing market forces where appropriate to, to um, ensure that privacy is protected. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy that we've got this far, and thank you for all your fine work. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Further questions or comments at the moment? All right, seeing none. Um, uh, I already um, said thank you, but I really can't thank you enough. Um, and, I, uh, and I also really appreciate the board's careful attention um, to what is, of course, a very important task for the board and also a particularly complex one. And the board's, um, uh, the board's assertions of how they're looking forward to public comment, um, which I am as well. I think that will help us as we work through the regulations, hearing um, comment from, from all stakeholders in California through the formal process. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I just will um, go ahead and read um, uh, the draft motion that I've put together. So we have that, and then we will ask for public comment um, before we move forward. So um, the motion um, that I think that we are considering is to approve the proposed regulatory text for section 7000 to 7304 and authorize the executive director to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process and public comment period, make any non-substantive changes to the package, and set the matter for a hearing. Um, and so that gets us up to um, accepting public comment, doing a hearing, and then of course, as the process subcommittee outlined for us, um, the board will need to meet in order to discuss the regulations in more detail, to discuss public comment, um, and decide um, where we are um, at that stage of the process. Um, but this would get the um, regulations into the formal rulemaking process. Um, with that, I would like to call for public comment um, on this topic, which is the com combination of agenda items um, three and four. Um, there, we are um, hoping that we can make this very smooth um, with the technical complexity notwithstanding. Um, so if everyone can be just a little bit patient and follow directions for a second, it will help. So for those of you attending via Zoom, if you'd like to comment and you have your hand raised, thanks for being um, proactive, but please lower it now. We'll wait a second and then staff will lower any additional hands and I'll ask people to raise them again. The reason we're doing this is because we've had people raise hands and then walk away and forget that they were there and we're trying to avoid that and make sure that we hear from everyone who wants to speak on this. Um, so if you give us a second to do that, um, while um, we wait, I, uh, if any members of the public attending in person here in Oakland would like to comment, please rise and form a line behind the podium, respect social distancing. Okay, Trini, are the hands down? Okay, great. All right, thanks everyone on Zoom for your patience. Now, if you are attending and would like to comment on this topic, um, please raise your hand using the raise your hand function on Zoom. And we'll wait a second um, to let the queue build on Zoom. Should I begin? Uh, sure, could you let me know how many? Um, right now there's one hand one. raised. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, before we um, start speaking, I'd just again like to remind everyone to stay on topic um, so that we are in compliance with Bagley Keen. Please keep your, minute, your comments to three minutes or less so every speaker has a chance to speak. Um, and, uh, and of course, just let us know if you have questions. We look forward to hearing from you. So um, yes, Ms. Hurtado, um, please begin. Okay, our first speaker is Lucine Chinkesian. Uh, you may now speak. You have three minutes. Lucine Chinkesian, Council at Civil Justice Association of California. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. We are still in the process of reviewing the proposed regulations, but have a few initial points we would like to raise today. Uh, Regarding that proposed symmetry choice standard for a dark pattern, it is overly broad and likely unworkable. 
the regulations can support clarity by specifying that the definition of dark patterns is focused on design practices that amount to consumer fraud. The consumer fraud approach is a well-developed and highly effective standard, while the symmetry choice standard would interfere with design choices that seek to promote benefits to consumers while navigating a product or service experience. As to the global opt-out preference signal, the CPRA clearly states that businesses have the option of honoring a global opt-out signal or providing a do not sell button. It is agency overreach to try to remove the choice created by the statute. On a related note, we appreciate the alternative link option and would request clarification that this is in the menu of options for opt-out. To the extent that new regulations are created around ADS or other areas, we would request the enforcement deadline be extended by at least six to 12 months. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Ms. Hurtado, are there, is there further comment? Uh, yes, we have one more commenter. Our next commenter is Titi Gwen Nguyen, sorry. Um, one moment while we promote you to panelists. Okay, uh, you now have three minutes. You may speak when you're ready. You might need to unmute. Oh, we just received a message that they did not raise their hand. Oh, okay, all right. Sorry for cold calling. <laughs> <laughs> The hand was raised, though, I promise. Okay. <laughs> Is there anyone else on Zoom? Um, no, we, no more hands are raised at this time. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, no one in person has stood up, so I'll just give a moment. I apologize. I am a law professor in my day job, <laughs> and I don't mean to put people on a, the spot, but it's kind of part of my, my <laughs> job. And I want to be sure everyone has a chance if you're just thinking that you have time um, to decide a comment. All right. Um, so thanks, um, thanks um, uh, to um, uh, the, the woman from CJAC for the comment. And um, we really do look forward to um, comments um, uh, that we get through the formal process. Uh, I will say um, a little bit about what I personally um, hope to see in comments. Um, if you are a consumer, um, just let us know what your experience is. Um, I mean, let us know anything you'd like, but if you can let us know something about your experience, that would be very, very helpful. If you're a business um, looking to comply, it would also be very helpful to have specifics as to um, any successes you've had complying, any challenges that you have complying, challenges that you might anticipate or successes you might anticipate with the amendments to the rules and, and to let us know specifically how that might affect you um, and, um, and any ideas that you have for addressing it, including regulatory language, um, if you can. So those would be particularly helpful comments um, uh, when we get to the formal rulemaking process. Are there any other board comments or questions before we Go? Yes, Mr. Yeah, Ray. Uh, yeah, I just want to second the, the request that, you know, if you do have regulatory language suggestions, um, please submit those, you know, so that we can consider those and, and not just have to guess, um, you know, what changes that you would, you would like or suggest. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Also, we can't change the statute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Chair do, Urban. Yes. Excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, we do have one more hand raised. Oh, if you okay, wanted. sure. We will, um, let's go back to public comments since we do have another hand raised and then we will move on. Okay. Uh, the next commenter is uh, Howard Pixel. You have one moment while we promote you.
지금 Okay, Howard's Pixel, you have three minutes. You may speak when you're ready. Please unmute. I finally found the button. I'm sorry for okay. delaying uh, my comment. No I think worries. it's a, a well done draft. And um, I'm concerned about the lack of specificity for being able to opt out. The uh, practice right now of suppressing the, um, the cookies is very varied among sites. Uh, some sites do it right up, up front, or you know one click to do it. Others, it's buried in the uh, privacy language. Now, I believe you've dealt with the privacy language, but I don't think you've dealt adequately with trying to promote some kind of a standard so that users know exactly what to do. That's the first comment, and the second is uh, that it should be somehow recorded so that you don't have to answer every time you go to a site. We don't know whether the cookie um, uh, settings or button uh, is maintained between uh, sessions, maybe. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Pixel. Ms. Hurtado, is that? Uh, that, that was the only hand. Wonderful. Was thank you very much. Um, thank you to um, those who engaged in public comment. We appreciate that. And we do look forward to comments during the formal proceeding, should we approve it. And with that, um, may I have a motion to approve the proposed regulatory text for sections 7,000 to 7,304 and authorize the executive director to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process and public comment period, make any non-substantive changes to the package, and set the matter for hearing. Sure, we're good. I'll so move. Thank you. May I have a second? Yeah, I'll second. Thank you. I have um, a motion from Ms. Sierra and a second from Mr. Lay. Ms. Hurtado, would you please call the roll call vote? Uh, of course. Ms. Delatori? Aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Uh, Mr. Thompson? Aye. Ms. Urban? Aye. There are uh, Four ayes and one absent. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hurtado. The motion carries with a vote of four to zero. Uh, thank you very much to the board, um, of course, to staff and council, um, and to everyone in the public. And I will look forward to um, uh, seeing the formal rulemaking process for this package. Um, congratulations, everyone. I feel like this is a big step to get our regulations um, into the formal process. And thank you. Um, with that, we will return to agenda item number two, um, and thanks for everyone's patience. My understanding is that this is a brief clarification, um, but I will turn it over to Mr. Brian Souble, our acting general counsel, um, to um, to say a little bit more. Good morning, and oh, let's be careful. It's mine. Okay. Good morning, and thank you, Chair Urban. Um, we just had a sh very short period of time in order to get agenda items for this, uh, this morning's board meeting. And at the time, I thought there was something that needed to be more clarified on the item that we had discussed at the last board meeting. Um, however, after looking at the language and then taking a deeper dive into the statute, I don't think there's anything that we need to address with respect to that item this morning. So um, there's no further discussion that's actually warranted on it at this time. Um, we will just proceed with what had been authorized by the board at the prior board meeting. Thank you, Mr. Souffle. Any questions? 
from the board a comment? Okay, wonderful, thank you, Mr. Sibley. So the version of the incompatible activity statement as amended by the board last time will be circulated and put on the website. That is correct. Wonderful, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, is there any public comment on this um, item? I see no hands raised at this time on Zoom. Thank you. Anyone here in person who would like to comment? All right, I'm seeing no request for public comments in uh, person either. We'll move to agenda item number five, public comments on items not on the agenda. This is the uh, item I mentioned at the top of the meeting in which the board invites comments on items that are not otherwise on the agenda. Before we proceed with public comments on this, please note that the only action the board can take is to listen to comments and consider whether to discuss the topic at a future meeting. No other action can be taken on an item at this meeting. Although this may seem at times like board members are not being responsive, we do not intend to be, and following these guidelines is critical to ensure that the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising either the commenter's goals or the board's mission. Um, so with that, um, is there anyone who would like to comment on items not on the agenda um, on, on Zoom? There are no commenters at this time. All right. Um, comments um, from someone in person. I see we had, do you have um, a commenter? Yes. Please step forward. You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, um, Chair and members of the board. My name is Edwin Lombard, and I am here as a small business owner, and I consult with the uh, and represent small black-owned businesses throughout the state of California. I've been working hard to keep black businesses apprised of the privacy regulations that you are trying to implement. But the agency has not been forthcoming about its process. Its lack of outreach to small businesses are the consequences businesses will face as a result of these regulations. Further, I'm concerned about the message the board is sending about its willingness to hear more from the public as it opted for a staff lead meeting, staff led meeting during the upcoming public comment period. In conversations I've had with black businesses across the state, it has become clear the board should be taking more, talking more with small black owned businesses and not less. More needs to be done to reach out to businesses where they are and help them gather input on regulations that will affect their bottom line. While releasing the draft regulations is a big step in the right direction, they're incomplete. The board has already indicated that there are multiple issues that have not been addressed, so we don't even have a full draft to review and comment on. There are enormous compliance costs associated with these regulations, and the claim that small businesses will not have to shoulder the burden of these costs is simply not true. Small businesses rely increasingly on online platforms and making these, uh, and making these platforms more costly and less effective will have a direct impact on them and the consumers and communities they serve. How are the members of the public, especially small business owners, whose livelihoods are impacted by these regulations, expected to participate in the upcoming public comment periods if the members of the board might not even show up? We are asking for a transparent, inclusive process informed by input from California small businesses. California cannot afford to implement regulations that force small businesses to close their doors, especially as minority-owned businesses have already been disproportionately affected by the pandemic and so many other ongoing issues. Also, in your last meeting, the board expressed preference in conducting staff meeting-like approach during the public hearing testimony, which means the board's presence will not may not be necessary if my understanding is correct. 30 seconds. If true, this is unfortunate. Lastly, the board needs to commit to a part of the regulation or in some formal capacity that the enforcement deadline will be extended for six months to give businesses time to comply. This is far, this is fair in light of the board's uh, lateness in 
adopting regulations. It's not too late to get this right for California. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lombard. Is there further public comment? Yes, there's public comment on Zoom. All right. It takes a second to transfer over. Our next speaker is Mitchell CH Michelle CHCC. There we go. Just one moment. Michelle. Hi, yes, yeah, sorry, it's I was supposed to be Luis Lopez. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lopez, you have three minutes to speak. Your time begins now. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the board. My name is Luis Lopez, and I'm here on the behalf of the California Hispanic Chambers of Commerce. It is important to remember that privacy regulations will impact California businesses of all sizes who operate online or use online services to reach and serve customers. We appreciate that the agency is now releasing its draft privacy regulations, which will impact millions of California businesses, including approximately 1.2 million minority-owned businesses. While this has been a significant undertaking, our members have serious concerns about the lack of transparency regarding this process and the effect new regulations will have on their ability to serve their communities. Some board members and staff have previously indicated that the agency will miss its July 1st, 2022 statutory deadline to adopt regulations. However, we have not heard when the agency will actually adopt new regulations or as important if and when the enforcement deadline will be extended to ensure ample time for businesses to comply with the new regulations. The board needs to commit as part of the regulations or in some formal capacity that the enforcement deadline will be extended by six months to give businesses time to comply. This is fair in light of the board's lateness in adopting the regulations. Will you let these small businesses know today how long you will extend the enforcement the enforcement deadline to make sure they have enough time to prepare for them as intended in Proposition 24? As you are all well aware, the pandemic has forced small businesses to learn on the fly to connect with and serve their community customers online just to stay afloat. Thousands of businesses were not able to make the transition. The last thing our state needs is to force the closures of more small businesses in an attempt to rush a complex regularity framework that can have severe unintended consequences. These consequences are largely avoidable. I strongly encourage you to engage more small businesses in these process. Be transparent about what you are and are not doing and study, study the impact of these regulations on small businesses in our state. We are all counting on you to get this right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lopez. Ms. Hurtado, there are no other commenters at this time. All right. Um, then I would like to thank our commenters um, for this item. Um, uh, we very much appreciate your, your engagement and participation. And we will move to agenda item number six, which is the opportunity to discuss future agenda items. I have a running list um, that I went through in the last meeting. I could go through it again, but um, I won't unless you want me to. Um, and would like to ask if the board have uh, any agenda items you'd like to suggest that have come up? I, I would. I mean, yes, in, in regards to um, these public comments, can we, and maybe good ask the staff, like, can we get a legal opinion on what we can share around enforcement deadlines? I do know this is something that the public is interested in, but we are also, as a, as a board and as an agency, not allowed to say a lot of things uh, because of underground rulemaking rules. 
Um, is there any way we could share that with the public, maybe explanation about underground rulemaking or anything like that? Or uh, I'd like to hear maybe your all thoughts on, on if that would be a helpful agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Lay. So an agenda item to give us the parameters and what we can discuss and maybe options. Yeah, and, and we don't, I mean, I would I'd like to hear the staff's opinion too, if, mm -hmm. if that's allowed on whether that's something that we should do or we can do. Um, because yeah, I do think there's, there's a communication gap that, uh, you know, we are as a board by the rules and by statute um, kind of constrained by. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, I'll put that on the list. That makes sense to me. Any other uh, requests or questions from the board? I yes, would, Mr. Thompson. I'd echo Mr. Lay's observation, and uh, I think he's, he's spot on to, to agendize that for a future meeting. Uh, I think we probably, sh I want to have the ability to discuss um, kind of how we're going to process changes, proposed changes okay. to the rules on a future agenda. May not use that item, but um, want to have the option. All right. Any further I, items? I don't have anything in addition. Okay. Um, wonderful. Um, so I have um, a legal opinion and possibly guidance from staff on what board and the agency can disclose on enforcement practices and enforcement deadlines um, and maybe what options are. And um, uh, an agenda item that would allow us to discuss how to process proposed changes to the rules that we receive in the public comment process. Yeah, they could yeah. be, I wouldn't limit it to okay. received through the public comment process because they could be for generated from, by ourselves. Right, well. okay, sure. I was just imagining what meeting that would be. Okay, um, thank you uh, all very much. Um, and um, uh, are there any public, um, excuse me, any agenda items uh, or, ta or, or comments on potential agenda items from the public? We do have one hand raised. Okay. Okay, our speaker is uh, Jeremy Barnett. Mr. Barnett, you have three minutes to speak. You may begin now. Thank you very much. Um, I greatly appreciate all the work of this committee um, and for the evolution of CCPA and CRPA uh, to help move things forward. I think, uh, I, I think that we all acknowledge that the need for clarity and transparency in working with, you know, certainly online privacy is really important. I, I wanted to suggest that perhaps in the future when we're discussing or as the committee is looking at, you know, enforcement, um, that perhaps there's an agenda item relative to, I don't know, call it tools and technologies that can help companies comply um, it feels like there's a lot of emphasis on the, the regulations and the language around it. Um, but I know as, you know, as a technology company, it's really difficult for a lot of companies to comply when they don't have the tools or understanding in-house to help them, you know, identify, monitor, manage the, the myriad data elements that are being requested to be to be managed. So as a both a, a regulatory body and as a leader in the state of California to help companies figure out how to do this, it would be really helpful. And maybe it's, you know, it's um, something of an adjunct advisory board or something like that to help the committee understand i mean california we are we are developing the technology that both causes the, the 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 privacy concerns as well as the technologies that help people identify the privacy concerns like we have rich rich resources right here in the state um you know from the north and the south ends of it and i just wonder how a um public private partnership 
can be formulated to help address this because there are spectacular opportunities for for that specifically in California where we can we can lead by regulation and we can lead by enforcement and we can lead by technology um, I think it would really be a wonderful opportunity to figure out how do we how do we create such a 30 second warning advisory board yeah. thank you that's all thank you very much mr. Barnett um, public awareness and guidance subcommittee does this sound like something um, for you to think about or do you want me to just keep it on my list for general agenda items you know I I, I thought that was more that comment was more around um, you know tools to comply mm -hmm. with the privacy regulations yeah. um, I mean that could be something for, for our committee to, to talk about um, but I also think it, it you know regarding that idea and I know that in Europe they have tools and, and um, maybe it'd be better as like a stakeholder session where we can come in but perhaps we could take it up in our, our committee and then come back to the board okay sure I, I don't mean to for you know to, to I'm not telling you what to do I'm just trying to direct traffic and make sure that we don't lose um, lose it um, and that we have the right people thinking yeah. about it okay so we will leave it with the public awareness and guidance subcommittee for the moment and you'll yes. let us know what you think is a good approach yeah wonderful thank you very much are there any further public comments not at this time all right thank you all very much um, our final agenda item is number seven adjournment um, I would like to again thank everyone board members um, staff members of the public for all of your contributions to the meeting and to all of the board's work, um, particularly the work um, that we have been discussing in the meeting today, it is really greatly appreciated. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Oh, I say move. You. Thank you, Mr. Lay has moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Ms. Hurtado, could you please uh, conduct the roll call vote? Ms. Delatori. Mr. Lay. Aye. Ms. Sierra. Aye. Mr. Thompson. Aye. Ms. Irvin. Aye. There are four ayes and one absent. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. The motion has been approved by a vote of four to zero. This meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>